right, we will go ahead and get started and I will call this meeting to order. Um, um, the purpose of this meeting is for the St. Louis County Council and the yeah. public to discuss and inquire about bill number 146, which is on our final passage order of business, which pertains to approving the fiscal year 2021 operating and fiscal budget of the Bi-State Development Agency. The committee takes official notice of and admits into evidence all St. Louis County ordinances and resolutions. Um, roll call, please. Yes, Madam Chair. Council Member Clancy. Here. Council Member Walton Gray. Here. Present. Council Member Days. Here. Council Member Dunaway. Present. Council Member Fitch. Here. Council Member Trakis. Present. And Council Member Harder. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, so each year, as many of you know, we um, around this time, we meet to discuss the Bi-State Development Agency's budget request for the following fiscal year. They are on a different um, fiscal year than St. Louis County government and theirs begins, um, it's a July to June fiscal year. So that is what we will be discussing today. I would like to acknowledge um, much of the preparation that has gone into providing this budget. Um, this is something that we got started on uh, probably at least six weeks ago with some leadership from Chris Cron Howard, who is um, County Council staff. And many of us, all of us were provided the opportunity to meet with officials from by State Development Agency so that we could get started on considering this budget request and get this done in a timely fashion. Um, however, there were some council members who had some questions and we wanted to provide the opportunity to um, answer any lingering questions as we work towards approval of by state's uh, budget for fiscal year 2021. So that is what today's hearing is about. Um, we have with us uh, Mr. Talby Roach, the head of by state development agency, and I believe a few of his colleagues, as well as our St. Louis County budget director, Paul Kreidler on today's call. Um, we will start with Mr. Roach, who will give us an overview of the fiscal year 2021 budget request from by state development agency. Mr. Roach, go ahead. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. And of course, Madam Chair, thank you for the time and for the dedication, not only of the council and of the staff to try to move this through. We're trying to be as responsive as possible and try to provide you with all the information associated with our budget request. We do have a brief presentation, which I will, uh, it, it comprises eight slides, which I will move to shortly. The first two uh, will be actually handled by my colleague, Tammy Fulbright, and that is specific to the bond transaction, having to do with the questions associated with that. But we did uh, provide you with the documents in advance. I hope they met with your satisfaction, but of course, after the presentation, we'll be available for questions um, and we'll be happy to field those. So I'm going to go ahead and share content. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Tammy Fulbright, who you'll be hearing her voice next. Good afternoon. So we thought we'd start the presentation off um, discussing the bonds. And our bonds are sales tax appropriation bonds that were issued for the Cross County Extension. The investor security on these bonds are the timely annual appropriation by the county and the city and the pledge sales tax of the Prop M and the Prop A funds. We have additional bondholder security that we give to our bondholders because we give them first right to sales tax collections that come into the trustee. We also give them six months of pre-funded principal and interest. So when we make our interest payment in April and October, we also pre-fund those trustee accounts with their next interest payment for the next six months and our next six months um, principal payment. Mm -hmm. In addition, which I forgot to put on the screen is we have a debt service reserve fund on the 2013 and 2020 bonds. And that is also an account that sits over at the trustee if by chance we ever have a situation where we couldn't make that interest and principal payment, we can draw from that account to make those payments. When we go out to bonds, there's a 1.8 times coverage that's required. So what that means is for every dollar in debt, we have to have $1.80 in pledged revenue, sales tax revenue 
um, for that debt. In 2019 and 2020, we were nearing six times coverage, so almost three times that. Um, in 2021, even with projected reduction in sales tax revenue, we are expecting to be close to five times coverage. So for 2020 um, bonds, we went out and we asked three credit rating agencies to rate our credit and Kroll and Moody's left our credit the same. So the outcome of that was Kroll gave us AA plus stable, which is their second highest rating. Moody's AA2 um, stable, which is their her, uh, third highest rating. And S&P was a double A negative, um, which is the fourth highest rating, which still puts us in the highest grade investment level. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the S&P criteria. So in 2018, they changed their criteria, which is impacting us. Um, they linked sales tax and operations. So one of the things related to sales tax that you can note is that um, our uh, sales tax base is 85% overlapping with the county and the county's rate was affirmed recently. Um, and we do not have any authority to levy or collect sales taxes. On the operation side, our bondholders absolutely have no risk related to operations because they are paid from sales tax revenue only. And as the federal government noted with COVID um, and getting the CARES Act funding passed quickly, um, for industries like transit, we, we were gonna be impacted um, by COVID. And so we were um, given 142.2 or 4 million, I'm sorry, in CARES Act funding. So again, um, the rating change for S&P, they downgraded us two notches from a double A plus to a double A negative, but that still leaves us in the fourth highest rating, the high grade investment level. And as early as March 27th, um, they um, had put out a negative outlook on the transit, transit industry as a whole. So that's also impacting us. Um, we were actually in the market today and we had a very successful day in the market. Um, our bonds sold uh, three and a half times over. So we were really happy um, with the market and how we performed today in that market. Thank you, Tammy. And I just want to note that, for instance, it, it is our job to be proactive and move in advance, which which I believe we have. Now, we've been proactive in changing, of course, the revenue side associated with the county budget. Uh, we moved in, as, as Chair uh, Clancy mentioned, weeks ago and changed our budget projections to assume a 20% reduction in sales tax over FY21. And we'll be making that delta up um, through the CARES Act funding. Now, I'm sorry uh, for this chart. It may seem almost uh, daunting, but if you bear with me for a second, um, I want to highlight a couple of key parts that really kind of note uh, how our management is doing. So if you note before COVID, and I'm circling this uh, kind of poorly in red, you note that for the first time in nearly 40 to 50 months, actually 40 months, 42, uh, we were experiencing positive ridership. And so given that we had changed the system through Metro Reimagine, what it says from a managerial standpoint is that we were headed on the right track. Unfortunately, of course, COVID hit. And the reality of the numbers are, as associated here down in the pink at the bottom, year to date right now, yes, we are experiencing based on, and these numbers are through May, we should have June very shortly, 13.8% um, uh, reduction. And month over month, year to year, that it, it varies between 50 and 60% greater on Metrolink right now. So of course, what we owe you and the public is how are we reacting? What are our managerial principles in order to stabilize the system and have it there ready to respond to the public once our economy uh, recovers? So what this is, is simply a year to year difference. So this pre-COVID was where we were, let's say in January in, in our proposal to St. Louis County. But of course, what we did was change it from a revenue standpoint. And what, what we've shown here is the re reduction associated with St. Louis County's piece of this. And we have supplemented it with the CARES Act. And in this case, we're showing using roughly $80 million of CARES Act money. 
Just to go over the CARES money, as far as our current use, we will use roughly $20 million uh, to close out this year, which we're getting closing our books on right now. And then we'll use another 80 million, assuming these projections, leaving roughly 33 million at the conclusion of FY21, essentially as our cushion. And I would argue that, for instance, that reasonable financial stewardship is something that you should expect of us and also is reflected in the investor interest in the bonds. Just to note, there was an additional question about, of course, COVID and our reactions to COVID. And so that is with full transparency. There's only one way to play this, and that's straight up the middle. We all have to work together, not only to protect the public, but also to protect our employees. And as far as transparency is concerned, what I'm sharing with you is our web page, which obviously, because I put this one in the, in the presentation, it's slightly out of date. This is from July the 1st. But we post every single day on our analysis where our current uh, employees COVID positives are. And of course, we surround those employees with with quarantines uh, as appropriately needed. We do analysis of video evidence to be sure that we don't have any uh, issues associated with that. And we're very aggressive about um, trying to protect both the employees and the public. With regards to that, this is just a partial list of what are some of the things that we've been doing. Indeed, some of the things that we've been doing since March. As a matter of fact, since March the 23rd, we have been screening 100% of our employees in temperature screens and other uh, central health measures to try to assure the health of our, uh, of our workforce. And that has been going on on a 100% basis, includes, for instance, both Tammy and I, uh, I'm wearing a, a wristband, which I can't show you right now because I'm sharing my screen. Um, but we, we do that actively every single day. And then you notice, obviously, we're using enhanced cleaning and disinfecting on all rolling stock. We are re we're requiring face cover coverings, contactless fair payment, polycarbonate shields. I would, I would note that we have 425 buses out on the system and every single one has been uh, retrofitted in many cases with polycarbonate shields to protect the public and our, and our workers. We've added hand washing stations, we've done mask distribution to the general public and to our rider and to our employees. And of course, we're trying to follow rigorously CDC guidelines. So I just wanted to share this slide with you because it's a good illustration of essentially what our average uh, operator is, is going out. And, and we would consider them our frontline heroes right now. We still have to move the city. We still have to get those essential workers out to their jobs, including to the Schnucks, including to the Deerbergs, including to um, the healthcare facilities. And as a matter of fact, some of our county crosstown routes actually experienced increases in ridership during the COVID crisis because we were seeing in added employees go to, for instance, the food distribution centers and so on. So these measures were absolutely critical. And I would note, you, you can see in this picture the polycarbonate barriers that were added as an extra measure of, a, of protection for our operators. And for instance, you see the basis of the contactless fare. This is a typical fair um, media, and uh, we have added a contactless app, which is employed right now, which uh, um, cuts down on the on the person-to-person -person contact. Uh, I cannot leave this without, of course, giving a quick update on where we're going in our movement towards increasing our security. As you know, we have a third party uh, scorecard that's being put out by WSP, independent of us, with East West Gateway. And we just went through an evaluation in June, which I'm happy to provide to everyone, which has been very positive. Does not mean that everything is perfect. Uh, we, uh, we move through an urban environment and not, uh, not everything works perfectly, but what I can tell you is that we are progressing very positively. 
As a matter of fact, I asked my team to go out and talk to Captain Melius, the leader, uh, St. Louis County leader of the Joint Task Force, just yesterday to be sure that I could say today to you all that he was happy with our with our communications and with our coordination. And that's true with all three of our police departments right now. And I think that's an unprecedented precedented step forward. Does not mean at all that we are finished and that we still don't have work to do, but I'm doing my best to get that done. So I'm going to unshare my screen right now. I hope. I hope that worked, and I, I have Tammy, uh, just for convenience, um, we're trying to social distance as best we can, but since we had one presentation, I wanted to be sure we were thorough with questions. I'm going to try to keep brief, and uh, I will pause at this point and ask if there are any uh, questions of the council. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roach, and thank you, Ms. Fulbright. Um, at this point, I will open it up to committee members for questions. Who wants to go first? Madam Chair. Councilman Harder, you have the floor. Yes, Toby, can you go back to that slide uh, that showed the, uh, the pie charts on the uh, money? It was like your third slide or so. There we go. There yes, go. sir. So if I'm understanding this right, is that your ask uh, in the past, uh, we funded by state Metro, the whole thing about 154 million in the past, the blue portion of the pie. And then this time for, for the next year, you're asking only for 121 million because you're getting subsidized with CARES Act from the federal government. Is that true? It is largely true. However, I want to point out that um, this comparison is just on an operating and does not include the debt, the debt and capital, which we account for separately, just in standard accounting practices. Um, so it does not include the entirety but yes, um, in, in concept, that is right. We reduced our, our appropriation request um, based on a 20% reduction from St. Louis County and negotiated, actually, I should say Tammy Fulbright was really more instrumental than myself in negotiating that. Um, Tammy, do you care to clarify a bit for me? Sure. So um, just to take you back. So in 2020, our total request was 164.3 million, and that included operating, um, as Toby mentioned, the debt, and then also the capital piece of that. Um, and so our request this year, due to um, the reduction of the 20% sales tax, is in total 134 million. And that makes up the 121.2 million in operating, 9.1 in debt, and then 3.7 in operating. That's how we get to that number. And the money you're receiving from the CARES Act, how does that need to be spent within your organization? So what we are doing is we are spending it exclusively to support uh, the the uh, on an operating basis over a period of time to make up for what is inevitably the economic losses of our partners, like, like St. Louis County. We, we believe that this is the most reasonable way to be financial stewards and be fair and distribute that money evenly across the spectrum. So when we were doing these uh, fundamental projections, we went in early with uh, St. Louis County staff and for now, we're projecting that reduction at 20%. And I need to uh, complete the statutory requirement to pass this budget with you. Obviously, there are some projections. What I think we'll anticipate doing is after we get through the first quarter of this fiscal, we will look back and see where that sales tax is, tax is tracking. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why in the planning purposes, as I mentioned in the verbal part of my presentation, that we have a reserve at the end of FY21. If, for instance, the sales tax are worse than what we are projecting. 
So you're projecting a 20% decrease in revenue for 2021? Yes, sir. Okay. But since you are only, what, one month into your budget right now, we don't know if that's going to be accurate or not? Correct. We, we don't, obviously it's a projection and, uh, and that, of course that's over the entirety of FY 21. Obviously this first month is, will probably be the worst of all 12. Um, but projecting it over a period of time, discussing with, uh, of course, our colleagues over in your office with Mr. Kreidler, et cetera, and with, uh, for instance, one of the benefits of going you know, out on the municipal market is that we've also asked some of those partners, are these reasonable assumptions? And I would, I'd like to say confidently that the answer is yes, but it is true. It is an assumption and it is reasonable for you to ask me, are we also holding out some reserve in case there's a worse scenario? And what I'm telling you is that indeed we are. Okay. And finally, when you talk to like uh, transit systems around the country, what are their projections both on a uh, decrease in revenue and decrease in ridership? And how does it compare to St. Louis Metro? So actually in de decrease of ridership, we're doing better than many other parts of the country, um, uh, especially the larger systems. Um, and we believe that has to do with some of the more successful cross town uh, bus routes, which have remained, you know, fairly solid. Um, uh, so we're doing a little better there. Uh, revenue is, um, uh, is comparable as far as the sales tax is concerned. Although I would note, I'm not a specialist, but we've tried to look at what other comparable areas of the country. Typically we try to look at other Midwestern tier two uh, type cities, um, for instance, like uh, in Indianapolis or maybe a Pittsburgh or some of those. And, and with those comparables and, and Kansas City, of course, um, uh, our colleagues tend to uh, uh, agree with our general tracking. Okay. I've got a few questions on security, but since we're just talking about budget, let's stay focused there and I'll uh, give back my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Harder. Who else has questions? Madam yeah. Chair, if I may. Councilman Trakis. Thank you. Um, Mr. Roach, thanks for coming today. Um, just some questions with respect to your provision of services. Um, when would you say you began reducing service based on COVID? February? March? When? Uh, really, March. Okay, so fair to say March, April, May, and all of June, you offered reduced services um, based on the COVID pandemic? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, with respect to uh, January through June, that's the last um, half of your 2020 budget you're operating under, correct? Yes, sir. That is right. Okay. And um, as your colleague has already mentioned, you... Um, received your full ask for 2020 from the council last year, correct? In terms of your operating budget? Uh, we, we did, um, but it is of course, dependent on what the receipts are. Um, I understand that, but I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 162 million was asked for and the council approved that, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, is it also fair to say that from January through June, you had um, a full operating budget um, appropriated by the council, but provided less than full services during that period of time. Is that fair to say? Um, no. Uh, so there was some less operating revenue, which is a accounted for both. We lose revenue both from fair revenue and from, of course, sales tax revenue. And we- I understand that, but that would, that would impact um, your 2021 budget, would it not? 
No, also, also uh, FY20, as in, obviously, one of the things that we had to do with that we worked cooperatively with was a reduction in, in fares. As a matter of fact, we suspended fares for a period of time in order to uh, lessen the the person to person contact issues. Okay, um, and that was an important uh, step in in trying to do that. So there's all kinds of different effects, both in uh, a reduction in fair revenue, and um, of course, one of the things that we have to do is that even though we um, there are effects in in how much service we are putting out, we still have to operate a, a system is still operating. For instance, I can't, you know, sell any of the buses or do any of that. There are some modest decreases associated with fuel and so on, um, but but not many because we still have to employ those same drivers. We had to account for drivers then who were off on a quarantine basis and they still needed to be paid. Um, under the obligation of federal law, in fact, um, as there were changes to federal law associated with um, absence due to COVID. And we do have those numbers, and I'm happy to do an accounting of those in more detail. Um, these are certainly relevant questions, um, and they are real, and um, I'm happy to look into them on a, on a more basis if, if that's your request. It is, in fact. I'd like to know exactly how much revenue you believe you lost between June, January and June mm -hmm. of uh, 2020, and also how much your services were reduced during that period of time. So uh, we can expect for you to provide those to us? Yes, sir. Absolutely. We'll be happy to provide you with any numbers that you request. Okay. And... Um, in your mind, um, based on those numbers, wouldn't the county be entitled to some sort of credit going forward for 2021 since you um, obviously um, reasonably comfortable stating that um, the degree of services you provided were not commensurate with the revenue you received or at least uh, services that were anticipated based on that revenue. So wouldn't the county be entitled to some sort of credit if that's how the numbers came out to be, but I don't think that they will. Um, okay. And um, uh, of course, we we try to be fair and thorough with all of our accounting. And um, I, I, we, for instance, councilmen do not have any of our own money. We are stewards of the public money. And if there were a circumstance where we uh, had a credit due, we would certainly notify you of that and carry it forward. Um, I'm happy to do an analysis of that. Um, and I do not think it's the case, but I just don't know off the top of my head. And um, uh, and I'll ask my accounting staff to do so and, and send it to your attention. I appreciate that very much. And um, if in fact that is a case, then I, based on your answer, I'm assuming you would not have a problem um, giving the county a credit based on the, those results. Absolutely. I wouldn't have a problem giving any of our partners a credit. That is absolutely, and that's an obligation I believe I owe you every single day. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, provide those details. It's very reasonable for you to ask questions about how we're stewarding the money. And uh, uh, again, I want to stress our, our job is, is managers of funds that are essentially the taxpayers of the county and the city and St. Clair County. And um, that's a reasonable uh, question and I'll be happy to uh, to note it. Thank you, Mr. Roach. And uh, I've noticed recently, I believe that you um, made a uh, public statement that you received somewhere in the neighborhood of, not you, by state obviously, received $150 million in federal stimulus funds in addition to CARES Act money, is that correct? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I didn't make that statement, um, uh, and that's all I know of. Um, I do know that, for instance, the uh, federal government is looking at a few different prov provisions um, uh, with some acts that certainly I'm, I'm tracking. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, Invest in America Act, uh, for instance, was one of them. 
Um, and these would, of course, be interest to the council and, and to, and I would bring those to your attention. Uh, and they would be appropriate for us to have a thorough discussion about what the best way is to spend that money. Um, right. So whatever yeah. that money is, and let's just use my figure, $150 million, that certainly could be used to offset some of your um, budget um, needs with respect to 2021, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. And that's indeed exactly what we're doing. Um, as a matter of fact, no. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Councilman, I know what the 151 number is. So as you may know, we uh, Madison County is included and in, they're a separate district, uh, but they are included in what is our overall CARES Act appropriation according to federal law. Um, so they are considered to be within our district. So the, the entire CARES Act appropriation is indeed close to that $151 million. But of course, Madison County is entitled by federal law, by their um, urban formula to 9 million of that, meaning the net to buy state is 142, as we noted today. Okay. Uh, I think I'll defer um, until later, um, some questions I have regarding security, but I would appreciate if you'd follow up with those uh, numbers I asked for. Absolutely, I'll be happy to do that, Councilman. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Roach or Ms. Fulbright? Madam Chair. Councilman Fitch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Roach, I wanna make sure I understood what you said correctly. In your budget, you showed $79.3 million in CARES Act funds built into your budget. Is that all you received was the 79.3 million or is there other money you've kept in reserve? N that that is not all that we have received we're just projecting that for fy21 so our projections right now is that we'll use about 20 million dollars to close out uh well what was just the last fiscal year so fy21 so really the effect from march till um of course the the end of june um, then we're projecting the 80 million for fy21 which then will leave a reserve of roughly $33 million, which we're trying to be responsible about. Um, if for instance, let's say our sales tax projections are wrong and that they're down 22 or 23 million or 22%, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna provide for a reasonable accounting for you as our partners so that we have some cushion in there. Um, and so that's that's what I've done, um, and uh, and we 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 developed this strategy jointly, um, and we did it with uh, our partners over there and with St. Louis City and with with uh, St. Clair County. And we believe that's this is the soundest financial principle to to achieve stability um, and to not impact because obviously the county. Uh, Legitimately, you all are impacted as well as we are, and we're all just trying to manage through a very difficult situation. We have to spend, we St. Louis County have to spend all of our CARES Act money by the end of the year, this fiscal year, December. Are you under those same uh, constraints? No, sir, we are not. Um, so our CARES Act is actually distributed through uh, the FTA. Um, and so through what is traditionally called our 5307 money. Um, so we do have to uh, uh, put all of those uh, requests for allocations through uh, the regional office in Kansas City. Um, and one of the uh, aspects of this strategy is that I did actually um, have a meeting with uh, our regional administrator, Makti Ahmed, with um, with Tammy here and we went over the strategy and he endorsed it as a sound and good idea. Um, and so, th so we do not have the same restrictions of St. Louis County as far as over time. And we're trying to be a little conservative, just being concerned about when our sales tax revenue will rebound. Uh, and we're trying not to burden, obviously our funding partners unnecessarily. And it sounds like maybe you answered this question next. Um, we're not allowed to replace lost sales tax revenue with our CARES Act money. 
but that's exactly what you're doing in your budget, right? Replacing lost sales tax revenue. So it sounds like you're operating under a completely different set of rules than we are in county government. Is that a fair statement? Uh, it's yes. I mean, um, but just to, it is a fair statement. The way we are categorizing it, however, is, um, when we put an allocation to FTA, just so that I'm clear, we are we are showing we are charging back a percentage of our operating. OK, just so that we are creating a consistency over time um, so that we're filling that delta of funding. Um, but the reality is, is that that delta is a loss in sales tax and um, you know, part of the, this is just, you know, what you call the individual things, but we are not under that restriction. I have reviewed this policy with FTA and it, it is acceptable. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Um, Councilman Harder, before you um, ask a second round of questions, I want to see if there's anyone who has not asked a question yet who would like to. Uh, I don't have one on this particular subject, so I will wait. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Dunaway or Councilman Gray? Yes. Um, Councilman Fitch mentioned that they were operating under a separate or a different set of rules. Is there, um, I'm, I'm assuming there's a provision for that in the CARES Act federal money? Well, well, Yes, in the, in in our end of the CARES Act um, involves several different uh, direct appropriations, and uh, the complication in in uh, pulling it down is under which uh, federal oversight authority made sense to essentially steward the money, and in our uh, version of CARES was funded through the FTA, through the Federal Transit Administration, which who is our normal uh, federal oversight um, partner. And uh, they, they placed that specifically within uh, a traditional, um, what is normally capital funding, uh, referred to as $5307. Um, and that is normally a capital fund that requires a local match but they changed the legislation to, to allow it to be used for 100% operating. Um, other uh, transit districts have, have tried to draw this down as quickly as possible, um, but given that I have three different funders who are trying to manage their financial situation, um, we thought that it made more sense uh, to project this over a period of time to try to be uh, more responsible stewards. So that's that's how it works. Okay, thank you. Anyone else for a first round of questions? All right, Councilman Harder, you may proceed. This is a short question. Toby, <laughs> the money you asked for in, in the CARES Act, have you received all of that? Just like we asked for our amount, it, it came now we can start cutting checks from it. Uh, we have we've received partial. So what we are doing uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but we we are uh, asking for our CARES Act over a period of time. So so that we're creating a, a level um, situation. This this um, uh, I believe is a better strategy as far as uh, for instance, I, I have, you know, kind of normal accounting standards to go through with my partners like like St. Louis County. And by drawing it over time in a regular circumstance, uh, quite frankly, the numbers will be more cogent and understandable than having one big draw. Um, we probably could have attempted to draw all of it, but that is not what we're doing. We're drawing it over a period of time and trying to match it <coughs> Um, uh, to the loss in revenue. So if I under money you requested over time and that uh, going forward, you will get all of that uh, money that you say you are you have coming to you. 
there's not a provision that the feds could cut you off in you know october or december and and say that's that's it you got what you got you got what you're supposed to get no sir there are there are specific to this legislation there are no clawback provisions um associated with this program and um this of course also is seated again in the 5307 um, capital funding, which uh, we we have access to what is funded, and that's one of those uh, shared data sources that we work with FTA on um, and is associated with the capital side of our budget, which, of course, is in our budget documents as well. Um, and uh, that's in, that's how that works. So no, no, specifically to clawback provisions, no. Um, and uh, and and the provisions that we have done have been, um, uh, we have concurrence from FTA about the sadness of the principle. So just a summary. Uh, so at the end of the year, you will get everything you, you have in your budget from the CARES Act by the end of the year to make your budget, correct? Yes, No sir. shortfalls. No shortfalls. And, and as I'm, uh, and, and right now, to assure that there are no shortfalls, um, we've created this strategy, which again, roughly, and I can I can get an exact number, um, we're anticipating, but this is assuming that our 20% number is correct. If we assume 20% is right, um, then uh, we still have a reserve of roughly $32 million of CARES money. So let's say, uh sales tax came in and it was down 23 we we would be okay we would be able to make that adjustment without asking st louis county for any more dollars okay and, and i think that's a uh i want to adhere to that on the other hand of course if it, if if we go the other way and we go 18 then there will be more uh essentially joint money um accessible to to uh the group and i would owe st louis county as long as as well as the other partners to account for that fairly and to show what that credit would be as for instance uh councilman trachis mentioned okay so there's no callback if you come up short on your projections no they sir. Can't, they can't take it away from you they cannot okay thank you Councilwoman, Councilwoman Truman. Yeah, Councilman Trakis. All right, Chairwoman, thank you, Council. Um, so Madam Chair, um, Toby, can you go back to your, if possible, the um, Metro Security Scorecard you had put up as part of your presentation? Uh, I, I apologize, Councilman. I did take it down. Uh, That's okay. So maybe I can I can describe what my um, questions are and you can help me through it. In each one okay. of those categories, and there are six of them. You have sort of like a, a, a pie chart for each one. The way I'm reading it is that the dark area folded, filled in on each of those pie charts means that you've completed that much of the uh, recommended changes by uh, um, the, the consultant WSP. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, yes, sir, you are. And I can give you attached to that front sheet are several more detailed sheets, which I can send to you. And I can also give you the comparison to October, which was that was the last evaluation period. Um, and I'm happy to forward that to you. It is available also um, in the at the East West Gateways uh, website, but I, I'll send that to you directly. Okay, um, but at least you've answered that question. And so with respect to uh, one of the categories in particular, uh, police and security staffing, um, I want to talk about that in a minute, but yes, you've been sir. on the job a little bit more than a year and a half. Am I writing that? Yes, that's exactly right. Do you remember when you first uh, were hired? Yeah. Okay, so you remember when you were first hired, um, you told uh, um the public, you had three priorities. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay, can you tell us what those priorities were? Security, security, and security. 
Exactly. So my, my question is, just recently, all of us had the opportunity to watch on videotape an assault taking place on one of your Metrolink platforms where two of your new uniform security personnel were there and did absolutely nothing. Now, I want you to explain to me how you can sit here and tell us that you've made progress. The new security personnel are as a result of the recommendations of WSP, yes? Yes, sir, that is right. And, and, uh, and, and um, yet a uniform presence is on the station platform and the very people hired to intervene do nothing while a woman is severely beaten. How can you tell us that you're making progress when that happened, what, less than a week ago? Yes, sir. Um, so that happened actually on July the 3rd on Thursday. Uh, and I would concur, it was an extremely upsetting situation. And, and look, I'm gonna very first, uh, our team did not do a good enough job, okay? We are in that case, um, we did not uh, respond adequately, um, and I'm very disappointed in that. Uh, the reason why I can uh, say that we have progress is that, look, I'm going to get out and I'm going to answer those hard questions, and we're going to do our best to do a better job. And what I can tell you is that by concurrence of some of our other partners, including St. Louis County Police Department, WSP and so on, we have signs of progress. Indeed, yes, I would I would say that. But am I satisfied with that? No. And am I upset and accountable for that incident on Thursday? Yes, I am. Yes, sir, I am. And uh, we are doing an analysis of that very upsetting situation. Um, what I can tell you in a very, uh, your, uh, a distinction in words is that um, it is still a focus of my organization. It's a focus of mine. And um, while uh, we, we intend on making progress and making this better, I do not uh, say that we will be perfect. Um, we will do our best to contend with difficulties that do happen in urban areas. But I would agree with you that our response was unacceptable and not good enough. And I am accountable for that. Uh, and I'm here to be accountable. I accept your criticism. Um, and uh, we are doing an evaluation of that uh, situation right now. Um, what we owe you and the public is, uh, okay, in a bad situation, what are you doing? Uh, I think that's a reasonable thing to ask, and I think we should be able to provide that, and I'll be happy to follow up with you uh, specifically about that as well. Well, I, I just think it's important that we note that you spent, what, a million dollars with WSP last year to get her, their recommendations with respect to how to change and improve security, yes? I believe the contract was right around a million dollars. That's right. And um, you've since then, the last six months anyway, um, undertaken the, uh, the course of trying to adopt those recommendations, some of which by your own pie charts are three quarters adopted. Um, and, and yet we still have this kind of activity right under the noses of security when historically, certainly as long as I've been looking at it, um, by state carries an image as an unsafe um, transit system, certainly Metrolink anyway. And, um, and yet here we are. Um, all that money spent, um, significant portions of your operating budget devoted to security, whether it's the payment of different police departments, your private security, or your contract security. And yet, this is still going on. I, I for one, am, am incredulous at it. Um, there's no acceptable explanation for me. Um, I think it calls into question some issues that were raised at the time that this new security outfit was hired. Um, and perhaps you need to take another look at them. I don't know, but I do know um, it gives me great pause um, with respect to um, continuing to fund by state to run an unsafe system. I'm just really concerned about that. I mean, there's a part of me that says we should just give people who are uh, appropriate applicants Uber credit cards and let them take Uber to and from work because 
um, riding on your system is a hazard. But um, I'm not going to belabor the point. I, I know I'm not blaming you personally. I'm just saying I understand you have challenges in an urban setting, but uh, a lot of time and money has been spent talking about this issue, and yet um, it persists. So I'll let it go and let my uh, my colleagues pursue further. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair. Councilwoman uh, Days. Yes, I, I didn't realize that we were going to jump to security so quickly, but uh, there are a couple of uh, issues that, uh, you know, I, I want to raise uh, particularly with um, with um, Mr. Roach there, and they do have um, um, uh, devastating kind of outcomes in terms of ridership. Uh, and we are we are losing, uh, I understand, from uh, several CEOs that uh, people are trying to come here or people want to come here, and yet they don't feel that that the public uh, uh, transportation system is is safe enough for, th for them to do that. And, and so we've lost those people. So I want to know specifically, uh, you know, what are you doing? Uh, we we in St. Louis County can't afford to lose anybody. I mean, we're we're struggling to maintain the number of people that we have now. And so I, I need some specifics as to what you think can can uh, can happen. Uh, and I do know that regardless of how many months you have had um, no incidents, if you have one incident that, that just takes away from all the rest of the of the months that you had a, a, a good record there. So tell me something specifically that you're looking at changing uh, so that we can have a system that people will be will feel feel uh, good about riding. Um, not just the people who are going to work, but people in general, as we begin to open up this um, this county for con uh, from the pandemic. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So if you may, I I'll talk about two specific items, of prog one of progress and one of where we're going. And one is that our relationships, one of the major critiques of the WSP study was a lack of coordination and professional relationships between my organization and St. Louis County Police and the city police and St. Clair, Clair County. That has been fixed. I invite you to talk to our police partners and for them to actually say the professionalism of our relationship and our everyday coordination in deployment in making security better. Again, I admit it is not perfect. And for instance, we still aren't there in perception. We need to work through perception and that is going to take, we're going to have to work on that over time, but there must be progress. And I can confidently say that there's progress in that relationship. As far as a future item, so one of the things that we are looking at and, and have tested out right now on a beta basis was moving to an access control design principle. So for instance, we're at every single station, we have a single point of access to the Metrolink facility where there will be 100% fare checking. We actually have this in place at a couple of key stations right now, including the Central West End station and including the Forest Park station, where in order even to access the platform, you have to walk by our personnel who will check every single ticket. This is a fundamental basis of moving forward and of course, addressing what the public has asked for. The public has asked for their fares to be checked. So we are moving forward in this area. We have put capital funding aside to pay for those kind of changes. Uh, one of which we did in the refinance roughly a year ago with the help of, of you as partners. And I have an obligation to ask you how to send, spend that capital money. So that is still sitting aside. The other portion that we would use that on from a capital basis is an enhanced camera system. Now our camera system is good, but it needs to, it needs to move along the modern standards where we can more effectively share our camera system with, for instance, our police partners, and we can do better remote access which will simply, and then placing the cameras at the central point of access, again, access control, leads us to an overall safer system. These are the principles from a design, from a uh, study 
like WSP, which was very thorough and professional and invited uh, in, in invested in uh, experts from across the country where we could get ideas like this and now implement them. So those are a couple of concrete ideas, and I'm happy to sit down and talk further about that or to solicit ideas that you may have um, to enhance security on the system. Well, did we not discuss this access before um, ab about making sure that someone was checked at, at each uh, location, I, I thought we had that conversation last year. We did, and so we did implement this, this system on, and, and mostly we did it through the temporary barriers and some small design changes. So for instance, access control is successfully being implemented at most of our stations. There are a couple of stations that have dual um, platforms, uh, that creates some difficulties and some of the very low ridership stations uh, would be ones where it's not as important, but adding, for instance, the video aspect then, and then for instance, first the design feature and then adding the hardscape structures to support access control is a really key element. And it's something that we are progressing on uh, it is not finished. I really don't expect to be finished with security. I think we need to keep doing better and better and better. And until uh, people are starting to say that uh, it is a very, very safe system, I intend on trying to make it that. And, um, you know, I, I, I uh, invite all questions about it. Well, let me skip to the COVID deaths that you have. Madam Chair, I, I, I don't want to monopolize, but I just want to kind of jump in here when I do have an opportunity. Can you tell me about the COVID deaths? Were those on Metro? Were those on, on Bi-State? Were they both? And which, which, which um, I, I'm really concerned about that because we, we're talking about the spread of this disease and trying to control it. And and so your, your employees are adversely affected for that because they look at and see people every day. So tell me about the, the deaths that you've had and, you know, what, what, what are you doing to kind of make sure that these people are protected? Yes, ma'am. So uh, you saw so several of the things that we're doing in the slide, but just to specifically address it, we have unfortunately, yes, had two deaths in our employee ranks. We had a Colorado operator, um, and we had a, uh, a, a legacy employee at uh, DeBoliver who unfortunately passed away from uh, COVID-19. Um, what I can tell you is that we take uh, this very seriously. We try to take every single measure that we can in order to limit the risk profiles. Um, I would note that, for instance, at one time, uh, due to the COVID associated quarantines within our employment ranks, we had almost 350 employees out on COVID related absence. And part of that is pursuing a discipline program about calling quarantines when we have someone pe test positive. And we have done that and we've done that since March. In fact, our temperature screening, which has been in, in place since March 23rd, uh, is earlier than almost any other transit system in the country. And there's still some that are not testing 100% of their employees as we are right now. Um, so that's one aspect. Also, we have been very active about the personal PPE and making it available to our employees. It is there, it is available. We have good stockpiles. And we've also done the other small things. I noted the polycarbonate barriers. Um, uh, yeah, um, um, 425 of our buses. So we will do everything we can to limit exposure. And of course, we, we will be ready for instructions from our policymakers, because obviously I'm not a health professional. And if uh, we we're told to uh, tamp down service associated with any increases in COVID, we'll certainly do so. You have been in touch with our um, our department head, our health department head, to see if the kinds of things that you're doing are really effective. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so one of the functions that we have been following from a uh, policy standpoint is we have green lighted what is our, uh, known as our our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, 
And then that that EOC uh, um, fundamental uh, compact is then our EOC and and those leaders of that EOC uh, participate in the county EOC and then the city EOC and the regional uh, emergency operations center. And, and these are central depositories for the discussion of these issues um, and for what are the effective uh, policies and procedures. So that's step one. Step two has been that we have gone to other industry professionals, including in this case, the APTA, which is the American Public Transportation Association. Uh, and I've personally, along with staff, participated in uh, uh, emergency webinars associated with uh, uh, best practices, ideas associated with protecting both our employees and our workforce. And we uh, are trying to implement any kind of uh, discernible measurement that we believe will be effective with both the public and both with our employees. Thank you very much. That's it for now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, and I want to follow up on some of those questions that Councilwoman Day has just asked, if I may, Mr. Roach. Um, I know that you all had a, a, there was a hearing that you all were involved in this morning in the city, and this was a topic that came up about protecting drivers. And one of the things that I understand many of your drivers are advocating for is something that I believe you may have had in place during the first few months of this pandemic. Um, but have changed for about the past month or so, and that is um, passenger boarding procedures. Um, so the the concept is to have passengers boarding from the back of the bus um, instead of the front so that there is more distance between the drivers and the passengers. Um, can you tell me more about that and um, including um, if that was a policy that ever changed and when it went back into effect? So for instance, yes, we, we did uh, return to front door boarding. The real key element here is uh, the sooner we can start to get back to this, then that, uh, that allows us to, for instance, move back to uh, revenue generation through uh, fair revenue, which, which I owe uh, under the financial realities of my funding partners like St. Louis County, and trying to put that within balance of what the health risk is, okay? so. Uh, the sooner we can get back to the standard way of doing business, the better off we are. Um, and so, for instance, if we, uh, the cases would indeed spike more, we might need to back off that policy. However, I, I would point out that, that there's a really important aspect with front door boarding, and that is if we take front door boarding out, that means the disabled community can no longer access our bus system. Um, that is where the lift is and where the kneeling capability is for access, access to um, the bus, whether that be even elderly or, and, and this is a key component of our ridership. And um, part of what's being missed out on this conversation is that we have the danger of essentially leaving some of those folks by the side of the road. And I, I don't want to do that. So we have to make a difficult decision about when is the the, the correct time, and there's many different factors about that. And so uh, in order to mitigate moving back to front door boarding, we did, for instance, the polycarbonate barriers, and we did, for instance, uh, we are also, and we are the only, uh, uh, there's only a couple of other transit companies that are doing this right now, is we are, we are, uh, uh, engaged in incentive programs to get our employees, uh, and obviously they're worried and that's legitimate. Um, and we're trying to do our best to enhance their employment uh, so that um, they are uh, okay with doing what is a very difficult job. Um, could you though make it such that there is door boarding, but also front door boarding for folks such as you described who have different abilities and, and would need the front door boarding? It, it, it gets a little different from, from a revenue standpoint. Um, and I do need to try to get back to revenue generation, um, even though, for instance, uh, revenue does account for millions of dollars. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult issue. We have had some issues associated with um, what is known as loop riding. Um, so when we suspended fare and have a zero fare policy, 
Um, there are consequences of that um, having to do with some of the ho homeless population. And of course, the result of that, and I heard from my drivers about this as well, um, uh, when we had that circumstance, then the driver has to confront those individuals who are loop riding and put them off, thereby creating more person-to-person -person conflict and putting them more at risk. The so reason, is, mm -hmm, I, I'm just so trying to make the point that the policies have to be in balance with one another. They're very hard calls and we're trying to do our best. So. Can you clarify the connection between fare collection and enforcement and where passengers actually board these the bus or the metro? Yes. So so the the front door is really the only place where we where we collect fare. So when whenever people are coming on, they always go to the front door. Now they can exit out of either door. So it is uh, very unusual to have um people going on in a rear door basis and we just did that when covid was it was at its absolute peak and we were most we were trying to limit especially when we didn't have the polycarbonate barriers on a hundred percent of the fleet we were trying to limit exposure from the driver to the customers so going to rear door boarding but when you do rear door boarding it makes it difficult, if not impossible, to collect fares um, because uh, remember this is a 40 foot bus and that's 20 feet behind and we need our driver to concentrate on where that vehicle is moving. Um, and it would not be a reasonable um, accommodation to expect that driver who's concentrating on moving a, a very heavy uh, vehicle um, to then get out of their enclosure and there's fair policy for a rear door board. So I'm hearing there's a trade off here. Um, we can, you know, th and that's what all of this navigating this entire crisis has been about, really. And the trade off is economic reasons, um, you know, economic value, revenue versus maybe best public health practices. Um, and I, I hear the, I hear sort of the, the position you're faced with and the choice you're faced with, but are there other ways that we can um, recoup some of your lost revenue um, in order to make some adjustments to keep everyone safe and healthy, not just riders, but also it sounds like your drivers and operators and other personnel at Bi-State. Well, yeah, well, yes, ma'am. I mean, that's, uh, I, I would agree with you that these are very thorny and difficult issues and we're, we're trying to play it up the middle as best we can and and take those considerations in. And I, I, I will tell you, um, I'm not making it up that when, when I visited uh, the drivers and I do this frequently, really just to thank them for their work, um, I go to the facilities and when we were not collecting fares, I, it was not unusual for me to have operators say, Mr. Roach, when are you gonna start collecting fares? because then they would have interactions that were much more difficult for them to deal with. And uh, quite frankly, they wanted to limit their risk. I can't blame them. Uh, our operators, uh, look, this is a hard job. Not everybody can do it. Um, and, and they deserve our, our praise and admiration. Um, I tried to take their risk and the public's risk in, in the context of those trade-offs. And eventually I have to make a call, Chair Clancy, and I hope I've done the right the right one at this point with staff, um, but it's not in concrete. And, and of course, if, if what we're seeing is that there's a change in what's happening from a public health point and we need to make adjustments, then we will do that. So I know King County, for example, is one of several jurisdictions that is not enforcing fares and also has backdoor um, boarding policies on their buses. How do you know how agencies like that one are are uh, making up for lost revenue or is there something to learn from there? Yes, so they yeah. would be they would be burning uh, through their CARES Act or some of their reserves, obviously, quicker than we are. Um, so that's the trade-off. Um, no matter what, this is, this is revenue that, that we will be losing and need to replace with something else. 
Um, and uh, so that, uh, just to be fully accurate, that that would be what some of our colleagues have done. And, th and there's a mixture of that. Um, and for instance, also under, of course, one of the considerations here that we got questions about right now is also with security. Uh, the reality of, of security is that security is enhanced when we have at least at least a nominal fair policy in, in place. It, it Unfortunately, under the principles of behavior economics, people tend to respect um, systems in which they at least have a reasonable fair in place. And that allows us to enforce a code of conduct and so on, which I think you would agree is a very salient issue. Um, but it has to be seen in the context of the other ones. Um, so I, I will tell you that I, I believe it's a salient issue and an important one that I need to bring to your attention that no fair policy does expose us to, um, I think, what would be maybe issues associated with um, security. It just needs to be seen and the whole pie would be my point. Yeah, and I appreciate I appreciate the com complexity of the decisions that you have to grapple with right now. We, we all, a lot of us can relate to that. Um, but I just, you know, we've got to protect your drivers and operators. And I think not only because that's the right thing to do, but I think there's some pretty powerful economic arguments as well, because when people get sick or exposed and have to quarantine, that's, that's pay that they're, that you still owe to them, even if they're not, you know, producing the services that that they are employed for. Um, so I'm just, you know, I'm really trying to think about some ways that we can increase their protections given some of the constraints that you have. So that's sort of what I'm wrestling with right now. All right, I will uh, continue to open it up. Yeah, is that Councilman Fitch? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Uh, Toby, I didn't get a chance to ask under the, when we were talking about security, um, G4S, your, your new security contractors, going back to the incident that happened on the platform, the fight between those young ladies, um, I could not tell from the video what the security officer was doing or not doing, but I, I take your word for it that nothing was being done by the officer. Um, is that officer still working on the line? No, sir. Uh, th uh, they have been suspended. And of course, what we do is we do a full... Um, a review of the incident, because even if, for instance, maybe this duty doesn't fit that officer, it is valuable to us to get their perspective of the incident in a post incident and try to see what are the things that we could do better. Um, and for instance, Kevin Scott of my organization is heading that right now. Um, and uh, most of them have been completed and are put, being put together uh, literally as we speak. Thank you. Question. Councilman Gray. Uh, several questions. I know we have the two deaths. And, um, sorry, and I'm very sorry about those two yeah. persons who passed away. Were there any others, uh, employees who contracted COVID? Y yes, ma'am. And as I noted, we, we uh, post those online every single day. We track those every single day. I could, uh, well, well I, I do get a spreadsheet which I could share with the council about how we do that. And for instance, uh, so right now we're at a total of, of my workforce. Uh, we have 50 positives since March. Um, so 50 individuals within my employee ranks. We do break that out on a per facility basis to be sure that we don't see any anomalies. We also have, um, through our health services, uh, we follow up with these individuals to try to determine the point of exposure. Um, and, and it is true that uh, uh, we've had a significant number of our employees who've actually contracted COVID outside. Uh, and we know this because some of them were off duty when they contracted COVID. Um, but my point is, is that we do the analysis and we try to be sure that, that we as a company don't have exposure and, and try to uh, move that on a very detailed basis. My question was gonna be, um, prior to you putting up the uh, plexiglass and 
prior to and since, I guess I should say, you had people using the um, coming in from the back when it was free, fair or not. When did you stop that again? Uh, so we we returned to fair collection. I should remember this off the top of my head, but I believe it was June 1st. So my question is really trying to determine when did you have um, in, an increase? We have you made those changes or did it was it pretty stable? Was it we, more? We, we have not shown an increase. We haven't shown a decrease either. Um, so there does not seem to be any causal relationship between those two that we can determine right now. Um, but uh, obviously vigilance is, is required and we do review um, uh, our, our, our health services department do review um, and follow up with our, our, uh, our employees to be sure, you know, what their level of exposure was obviously in an interest of trying to keep them healthy. And going back to the incident last week, was that a, a, a police officer or a security guard or from the company that you subcontract with? I mean, contract with. It was a security guard. So the base level of our security. So um, those are our security guards um, that are through the G4S contract. Um, did the two people who were in the altercation, did they know one another? Or yes, you know? they did. so um, it was it was the result of a of a Facebook uh, post, <laughs> um, which they had a dispute about. Um, okay, that's good enough. I just wanted to okay. that yes. helped me to ask my next question. I know in some, and I'm not saying if this is. Let me preface my question by saying I don't know if this is a good or bad or uh, whether it should happen or not. But I know some businesses inform the security not to get involved in certain activity is are your security guards given such advice or do you know uh i do know and no no ma'am so okay. as an example that security and i went through this incident this morning they have a duty to intervene a duty towards the public safety and for instance, obviously, they did not meet that duty. Um, and that That's was good. the basis of their suspension. OK, good. That's good. So my last question is, and I'm, you probably cannot answer it today. I remember there was a time when I would take the Metro quite often to things like the baseball game and my children as well. And like I said, I don't think you can answer this question today. When did this change? to where people are now afraid to ride the Metro because I think it was pretty prevalent that a lot of us, I think, would take the Metro even from West mm -hmm. County to um, go downtown. And like I said, I know you probably, because you're, uh, you haven't been there but a year and a half, but uh, if you can some time in the future, give me that information, when did, I guess, security become a problem or the increase in, in uh, it, uh, incidents become a problem to where people no longer are comfortable with riding uh, on the metro. I, I can give you the fundamental ridership data over time. Now, I will tell you that um, we did have uh, a discernible dip in ridership over 2014 and 15. Uh, now that that also did occur in other parts of the country. So I can't exactly but, relate, um, but those are our key pivot dates. But that wasn't my question. Uh, I'm not asking when did your ridership decrease. I'm asking when did people uh, become afraid to ride, which may it may be a correlation, you know, to what you know your 2014 answer. But that's what I wanted to know, and why and what happened to make. Uh, to that things have gotten, I guess, considerably, considerably um, I don't want to say worse because and I don't want to discourage people either from riding the Metro because it is a big part of um, our city and county. But like I said, if you can and I don't 
if you have it now, but if not, you can get it to me later when the cha- it, this became uh, an issue. Now, when ridership decreased. Well, I, quite frankly, I'd like to know myself, um, and uh, I'll have to think about that, to be very honest with you, um, since it's a public perception issue um, that's related to ridership. I think it's a fair one and helps us try to um, essentially try to fix the system. Um, the reality is, is that I, I, I think it's fair to recognize that as a system flaw and as something that we need to work on together, including myself, and um, we intend to do that. Yes, I'm just wondering if there was a change in policy or what what happened, that's all. But just, you know, whenever you get that information, let me know. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair. Councilman Harder. I just have a clarification. Uh, Mr. Roach, you mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, uh, a good rider, a good customer of the system is someone who at least participates somewhat in the um, the service through their payment of a fee. Is that true? Yes. That is, that's so in in general under the concepts of behavior economics which i was re- referencing um it it is generally accepted that um a reasonable and fair payment system leads to a better code of conduct and or, since well before covid you were in the process of modifying the security on all the platforms. And one of the major, major issues we talked about last year was the non-payment of, of any kind of fare or people sneaking, sneaking on the system. Mm-hmm. Since all the security enhancements have been done and recommendations and consultations, now we got a system where everybody pays, right? That is the effort. Uh, the fundamentals of, of access control, um, which is a, is a fundamental base layer of security, is one that should lead to imp- improvement of the overall security paradigm. And uh, Councilman Harder, that simply is a fact, and I would concur with those conclusions. So right now you said, is it a majority or a minority of the platforms have some kind of access control where you have to show a fare? Uh, so I w- it depends on the time of day and it depends on uh, that, but I would say, yes, the majority of them at this point. The, the idea is to move to every single one of them and I just wanted to relate to you what what the um, what the goals were of the system associated with changing the actual physical components of the system over time. So, what do you think you'll be able to implement by the end of the year? A hundred percent of the platforms will have access control of some kind. It's a good question that I'm not able to answer right now, but I. I I think it's something that that we could take a look at, and I I, I would be happy to follow up with that uh, as to a proposed uh, date associated with um, implementing access control on the system. I I, I think it's fair for you as as a council to ask that we uh, make propositions associated with performance metrics, and uh, I just can't do that off the top of my head without doing a analysis of a system of our size um so but uh, i'm happy to do that but i'm saying that is not your goal to have a hundred percent access control by the end of this fiscal year no it is it it would be my goal (laughs) i just i didn't want to commit i don't want to make a commitment to you councilman that isn't reasonable from once it's looked at, at as far as every single station uh, what is what is the metric? 
It absolutely is our, our goal, and it's a goal associated with our security plan in place. Um, but if you if you wanted me to produce a timeline of where what I think uh, we would finish with that goal, you know, I, I I'm punting a little bit because, quite frankly, you need to look at where we have. Uh, you know, single access is very easy to do in certain circumstances. I would use the Cortex station. The Cortex station is designed to a single access point because it's the newest station that we've done. If you look at other stations, so we changed Delmar, for instance, closed off the Hody amount access. Um, that was a fairly easy uh, station to do. But then on the on the west side, it's a little more complicated because we have a parking lot on one end and then we have the street access on another. So my, my, my point is, I'm not, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I'm just saying that it does take, um, we're talking about a complete change in concept from an open system to one that has incorporated some of these fundamental principles. I think these fundamental principles, uh, or I know that the public is asking us to do that, and, and uh, I think that we need to get it done. But I, I'm simply trying to say that uh, some stations are easier to do than others, and we've already tried it on a pilot basis um, associated with using temporary barriers and, and something in that vein. And for instance, Forest Park being one of the stations where we did a pilot program, and the lieutenant from the police department, including Captain Melius, they were thrilled with the results in the increase in security when we when that was implemented. So we'll continue to do that and we'll move to 100% uh, fair checking. And that's a goal that I have. So you have somebody on staff that is daily handling that, that analysis and decision making moving forward with that as the goal at some point in time to be 100% access uh, controlled. Yes, so as you may know, um, one of the things that I did is I, I brought, because of the focus, I brought the uh, safety and security team in by state underneath my direct supervision. Um, and for instance, so I am the accountable executive associated with both safety and, and security as far as that's concerned. And my uh, security team now knows that now that we are working on the staffing level, we move to the hardscape level. Um, and one, uh, one initially right off the bat, which we got out um, because we submitted for a Homeland Security grant associated with um, enhanced camera system. So for instance, that's a goal. That's one of our goals as well, a huge enhancement. And that is headed out of the security department so that they are picking what are the most effective uh, hardscape measures associated with our security plan. And then from there, after they have an idea, it moves to our engineering department um, who would then uh, procure. In the case of, for instance, the uh, video, um, although we submitted for grants and that's my job, try to use other people's money as much as we can, but Perhaps once it comes, I have an obligation to this council to bring some of these ideas if I want to use the $20 million that we put aside for security enhancements. And, you know, I have that obligation to you. I'll recognize it again today where we will present you with ideas that we think would be major enhancements. A, a really good video system is one of those and uh, we'll move forward on it and yeah, I would be presenting to you for uh, approval. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Madam Chair. Councilman Drakus. Thank you. Um, Mr. Roach, uh, what does Bi State currently do either on its trains or buses with respect to uh, requiring passengers to wear masks? <laughs> So we, so we do require uh, the passengers to wear masks and uh, both our security and our operators um, enforce. And, and of course we ask first, we try, try to do it um, through a voluntary basis primarily, 
but we have distributed extra masks on both that those personnel do have have some to share with the public because what we're aiming for councilman is compliance of course and safety so we have extra supplies that are available to those and we have also gone out on a staff basis using all of our tsms and some of our uh, employees here from uh, headquarters to just be out on the system when we were moving to the mask requirement to distribute them to the public. Um, so we distributed nearly, I think it was 15,000 masks um, in general uh, to try to move towards compliance. Um, and that's and that's basically how we're handling it right now. So am I right in my conclusion then that your security personnel and or your operating personnel are supplied with masks to give um, passengers if they don't have one in yes. any case? We have a limited supply, of course. We want to avoid the um, uh, the perception of being the supplier for the whole St. Louis area. And obviously, we don't want to run out of supplies. Um, but yes, our operators do have the option to refuse boarding uh, to customers who um, are uh, continually uh, um, uh, violate that policy and we've had very limited incidents i had not one that i can recall um and again we're trying for compliance so if i'm understanding you correctly then it's a rare instance when a passenger doesn't wear a mask um, on a metro or a bi-state uh, bus or metro and train I wouldn't say rare, no. Uh, we've had circumstances, and one of the reasons we, we had two um, uh, circumstances where we went out as a staff in general out on the system is when there wasn't as much compliance as we would have liked to see. So as an organization, we went out on the system and provided more masks uh, to the general public to try to move compliance numbers up as 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 heavy as possible. So, do you understand the uh, obligation and responsibility you have to your passengers to make sure they're safe on your system? Yes, sir. Okay, and wouldn't that include, if necessary, the provisions of PPE masks? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So what, I, what I'm having a hard time understanding is you're telling me that, that your folks have the option of offering a mask to someone or asking them to leave. And are you enforcing it or are you allowing them to ride without? No, we, we are enforcing it. So this is also over the arc of time, uh, Councilman. So we weren't enforcing masks initially then we announced an enforcement uh, on, a, on a volunteer basis uh, first, that was step one. Uh, and we went out and started doing uh, mass distribution associated with that. Then uh, we were able to move to it being required in which we authorized our uh, employees to refuse ridership to individuals to try to move to compliance. Um, and uh, so what we're trying to do is move that arc to compliance as, as, as uh, quickly and as rigorously as possible. So um, no, uh, I would disagree with, your, um, with that characterization. It's just over a period of time. And um, you know, I'm, just, I'm trying to be as accurate as possible. Well, certainly not all of St. Louis rides <clears throat> on your system, right? No. Exactly. So, I mean, how burdensome could it be to make sure that whether it's operators or security could provide masks if necessary? I mean, I just don't see how that would be such a burden. Um, but be that as it may, um, I pointed out last week, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal um, relating to deaths from COVID um, amongst um, individuals that are required to use because of financial circumstances or otherwise public transportation. And um, those deaths and, and infections are disproportionately 
um, amongst minority groups. So, I mean, it's important that you provide a as safe a system as you can. And the idea that somehow um, not everyone's complying with respect, at minimum to masks um, is troubling. On that subject, I'd like you to um, supply to the council, if you could, um, the protocols you follow, you follow currently to make sure that your um, equipment is uh, sterile, or at least as clean as possible. I don't want you to have to get into it today, but I would like that information because, as I said, you have a significant responsibility to your ridership. Literally, in, in some instances, their lives are in your hands, not just from a security standpoint. Yes, sir. I'm happy to. We have, we have detailed systems, um, and uh, I'll be happy to detail that and get it to you specifically, including COVID-19 CDC um, recommended uh, disinfectants that are used all on our rolling stock at night in the evening. Um, okay. But there are significant protocols. All right. Well, I'll just wait for you to submit those. I won't uh, belabor the matter now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right, um, we will move on to public comment. We actually do not have any public comments today unless, um, Diane, there was anything that came in last minute. Um, no, ma'am. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our agenda today. Um, Mr. Roach and Ms. Fulbright, I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and, and staying with us for a while. This was a this was a long meeting. Appreciate your availability on short notice to come join us today. Um, to the committee, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm.